Welcome to IoT World Today. I'm Lauren Horwitz, Senior Content Director at IoT World Today. And artificial intelligence is increasingly touted as the solution to the kinds of problems we face today as COVID-19 hunkers down in the nation. Data will drive decision making in curbing the spread of the virus and other key decisions, such as how to restart the economy. At the same time, we need to take a balanced approach to AI and its ability to solve human problems. So today I'd like to welcome Scott Robinson, a BI and analytics expert and an IoT World Today contributor, and Scott LaJoy, Associate Professor of Health Promotion and Behavioral Sciences at the University of Louisville. So guys, welcome. Great Thank to be here. You. Good to be here. I have a lot of questions for you. So I'm gonna start with this somewhat long-winded one. We talk a lot about the potential of AI to democratize decision, data-driven decision-making, get, get that data in the hands of people who can make those decisions and have them understand it. But at the same time, we need experts to train the data sets, to develop the models, and at least initially to help interpret the results. So let's talk a little bit about why experts are so critical to AI and training data sets and how does it square with the disinformation campaigns that we've seen as COVID-19 kind of takes shape in the nation? How um, is expertise critical for several important reasons? Well, uh, Lauren, there's an awful lot going on there. Machine learning is, is complicated. It's really, really tricky stuff. It's like cooking, cooking a gourmet meal. Uh, if you're off on, on just the, the slightest detail, you can just ruin the end result. Uh, before you even get to the machine learning process, having the model correct up front is absolutely critical. Uh, to build a good model requires expertise from having built many models. Uh, not just expertise in model building, but expertise about the thing being modeled. Uh, those models are kind of like blueprints. And if, if you're building a big complex office building and your blueprint is not correct, then a little mistake in one place can cause big consequences and pileups later. Uh, so getting the details right requires expertise and experience. Uh, you have to know how all the data relates, uh, you know, one item to another. You have to understand how uh, variables interact. You have to understand the strength of those interactions. Getting the model wrong uh, is, is devastating because even a perfect machine learning implementation and even fantastic data and lots of it can, you can still get a bad result if the model isn't there. Their interpretation is also huge. You run them, your model and you uh, do your machine learning and you get your results. It's easy to be off on interpreting what the result is. You need expertise there at well, as well. Uh, I, I guess it all boils down to, we say healthcare AI, and when we say AI, we don't mean artificial intelligence, we mean augmented intelligence. It's machine plus expertise. Uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll talk to that a little bit as well. Um, I think that, you know, being a technical expert in in machine learning or AI model building is, uh, you know, absolutely um, crucial, but it's only part of the equation. Uh, in my opinion, the usefulness of a AI model depends on several factors. These factors include like the skills and motivation of the developers the quality and source and relevancy of the data, the interpretations and communication of the results, and the alignment of the results to other non-AI sources of information. And what's really important is that each of these factors require transparency. Um, if someone's looking to invalidate a model, um, that person's going to seek out any any one of those factors that I mentioned um, to find fault with it. And so, for example, if the if the programmer made some random tweet contradicting the model's conclusions at one point, suddenly the programmer's motivations become suspect and then the model itself might not be trusted. Um, so to at attempt to sort of counter this, the publishers of models, I think, need to make the model as transparent to the educated readers as possible, not necessarily experts, but educated readers. Um, readers should be able to, re to trace the data from results to the initial inputs and verify for themselves that the model's assumptions are reasonable. Um, a black box approach just can't be defended. 
So we've been talking a little bit about, you know, how to create transparency and and kind of acknowledge bias in these algorithms. But then at root too, you know, according to some data that I came across recently, only about there's only about 96% accuracy for some uh, ma machine learning problems, and that's kind of considered high levels of accuracy. And there are already naysayers concerned about AI kind of displacing human work, not necessarily being able to solve problems with, with accuracy. So how do we kind of assail this problem? And, you know, if not carefully managed, an AI algorithm will kind of go to extraordinary lengths to find patterns in data that aren't necessarily associated with the outcome it's trying to predict. So what do we do here in terms of accuracy? Well, that that Brookings number is 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 correct. Ninety six percent is considered high when it comes to accuracy, but it also can be a little bit misleading because it depends on the problem domain that you're talking about. If we're talking ninety percent accuracy in self driving, you know, semi trucks, that's not at all adequate. We're actually already up to ninety eight percent on on eighteen wheelers, and that's not good enough, obviously. But ninety six percent is excellent when it comes to to medical diagnostics. Uh, human doctors don't get it right that often. And when AI gets something right, within that 96%, it gets it more right than a human being would. Diagnostics are an example. Uh, diagnostic uh, AI can read x-rays better than human beings. Uh, all the areas where uh, you, know, you, you, you are able to uh, focus a particular AI on a particular problem, a particular domain, the AI is going to win. The best chess player in the world is, is an AI. The best Go player, the best facial recognition systems are all machines. Now, to get past that 96% and get better, uh, I think the problem is that uh, we're under training our systems. We haven't really found the sweet spot in terms of how long it takes a machine learning system to get good. The systems I just mentioned, all of them went through the equivalent of thousands of years of training, millions of training runs. It won't be long before that's the status quo, before that's routine. And and. You know, along the same lines, uh, humans have always lived with uncertainty. It's part of our DNA. It's our evolution. Um, and while we might, might not like it, the fact is that um, uncertainty exists in everything that we do. Um, and most of us understand intuitively that uncertainty exists and that errors can happen, um, particularly when we're talking about making predictions for the future. Um, take the, the horse the gambler at the horse track, right? She can use every piece of information available, plus her her experiences um, placing bets. And when the horse comes in second, you know, she's not necessarily surprised. She may be a little bit disappointed, but she's not surprised because she knows that no um, prediction is ever 100%. Yet with AI, if we tend to fault the system if it if it's wrong four out of 100 times, well, 96% is, is a pretty good number. It may not be a great number if you're talking about, uh, you know, multi-ton 18-wheeler on the interstate, but, you know, human drivers aren't that great either, right? Um, but what AI and um, other modeling s systems attempt to do is limit the uncertainty, to reduce that uncertainty as much as it can by incorporating various sources of um, variability. And I think that um, machine learning AI, the best thing about that is you can, you can incorporate unlimited, really, unlimited amounts of data to uh, reduce that uncertainty. Whereas with humans, we tend to have a, you know, we can only store so much information in our working memory at any given time. Um, but with every model from the most basic linear regression model to the most advanced machine learning model, we have to incorporate what I think of as error terms, right? So for the unknown source of variability, we got to, we've got to build in that uncertainty and plan to uh, uh, incorporate it. Um, and then I, I also think that if, if models are built and they're important and we're making important based decisions on it, that these models need to converge with other systems that have been developed independent of the model so that you get um, some sort of convergent validity happening um, 
so that's a nice segue to my next question, which is that, you know, we also have this problem where AI models are kind of developed with data, but to some extent in isolation, and then they leave development and they enter the real world and they may be involved in, you know, predictive uh, function and they nearly always degrade in, in performance after they kind of leave that development phase. Um, just in a kind of real world example, um, a model that might differentiate between healthy people and those with COVID-19 might start to degrade and fail when it encounters patients who are sick with the regular flu and have some uh, similar symptoms. So a drop of, say, 10% accuracy or more during deployment might not be unusual. How do we address that problem? Well, Lauren, you're exactly right about that. Uh, degradation of models is a, a huge huge issue. Um, it basically reflects exactly how human beings work in the real world. The whole point of a model is to reflect the real world, and the real world changes, and our experience in it changes. And in our heads, we adapt to those changes. We observe something new. We, you know, Our performance remains high because we tune our expectations. We tune our, our model of reality that we carry around in our head. Now, machines have to do the same thing. Machine learning depends upon the quality of the model. Models are going to drift over time as they get out of sync with the real world because the real world is changing. The model has to change with the real world. The solution to that is to, to learn to, to tune models in real time. And we have a lot of ideas about how to do that. You can There are you know dozens of books on, on Amazon about model building and about the importance of, of you know tuning models. And there are many hypothetical ways that we can develop that kind of real world real time tuning but we haven't really worked it out to where there's a clear direction for it yet yeah, i think i think um real time model tuning is a fantastic idea um and it sort of it mimics the way human behavior occurs you know you look at novice novice diagnosis um novice diagnosticians <laughs> sorry about that um and are young doctors, for example, they tend to be very rule driven. They rely heavily on the algorithms that they learn during medical school. Um, they form hypotheses that are, you know, basically um, line by line or very reflective of what they had previously studied. Um, and they're they're afraid to deviate from that diagnosis. Um, Whereas an expert, experts are much better at assessing, first of all, at collecting vast amounts of data and generating situation awareness. But then experts are also good at, at noticing when the, the information in the environment deviates from the information that the algorithm was built on. And so when that deviation occurs, an expert's more likely to adapt or change his or her original hypotheses. Um, so I think f if we expect an AI machine, an AI system to model human decision making, um, there needs to be a way for that information to be onboarded in a real time basis in, you know, recognizing when things deviate from the initial assumptions. And then if assumptions continuously don't hold, then the algorithm needs to be updated or discarded or or what? Um. And we've kind of seen this happening in real time with the models for uh, the spread of COVID-19 and, you know, certain predictions about the rate of spread, uh, the death rate. And that was always sort of predicated on us doing nothing. And in fact, we were, we've been doing quite a bit to uh, change the curve of those models. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as, as we, as human intervention happens and these models start to drift or adapt, mm -hmm. as you guys have alluded to, you know, what, how, how can we incorporate that into our understanding of the model, our explanation of, of the model, our justification of the model, we've sort of seen that happening as well. Well, predictive systems really are, you know, if, if there's any holy grail in AI, that's it. 
when you have a model that's that's highly predictive and you have a steady stream of accurate outcomes being fed back into the model, uh, then the model tunes, it tunes well, and you have a win-win scenario. Your outcomes improve. Same with COVID. You know, the, the more we, the better we're getting the model, the better the outcomes get, the better the outcomes get, the better work we can do on the model. It just is a, a cycle that just constantly improves, and that's what you want. Early warning signs where we know something is about to go awry are exactly what we want in healthcare AI. We want to know that there's a problem so that we can alter our behavior ahead of time. That That's the whole point of what we're doing. Uh, you and I talked in the past about uh, the, the project I did a couple of years ago where we were trying to predict uh, preterm birth, understand uh, what the circumstances were that were most likely to cause a preterm birth and spot it ahead of time, build a model that would allow us to intervene earlier and improve the outcome. The more you can get the outcomes right, the more you can measure them accurately, the better things get. An interesting thing I had going in graduate school was a faculty mentor who learned how to uh, look at the brains of newborn infants with a benign way of you know, reading the activity in their brains and spot incipient birth defects. Well, there's another example of you're gathering data in a process and building a model that you're constantly improving where if you spot the markers of a condition, you can intervene immediately to improve the outcome. And that system self tunes it gets better and better and better. In the case I just mentioned, uh, this, this led to a process where children who weren't being tagged as having learning deficits until their first day of, of kindergarten were being, inter, the interventions were happening in the first year of life and the parents were cued on, on the right way to handle the problem. That's what we want. We want predictive models with outcomes that are accurate and constantly being fed back into the model to improve it, to get a better algorithm. That's exactly what we should be shooting for with COVID-19. Yeah, I, and Lauren, I, I think that um, COVID is an interesting example. Um, viruses are amazing organisms, very um, resilient to any defenses that we put up, they're adaptive, they mutate to um, get around what what we've done, right? So the, there's a lot of um, uncertainty as to how a virus is going to respond to an intervention. On the flip side, humans are also amazingly uncertain and variable creatures as well, right? Um, in our current experience with COVID, um, with the pandemic, we've seen really tremendous re um, responses to calls for social distancing, hand washing, and some of the community mitigation efforts that um, have been deployed. And I don't think that we predicted that people would perform quite as as well um, as they've had mostly in you know, in most parts of the country, most parts of the world. Um, but now, as you see um, the virus, the pandemic has gone on and people are starting to get a little bored with it, I guess. Um, you're starting to see some real kind of unpredicted behaviors, right? This whole backlash of, uh, against wearing masks, you're, you're, we're starting to see the anti-vaccine groups come come back and say, no, we won't take a vaccine if it's developed, um, or people actively defying social distancing record, uh, recommendations. Right? Those types of behaviors are really hard to predict in advance. So like as we've been talking about, the ability to go back and update a model um, to to fit new parameters is just really creative uh, and, and necessary. Um, but I also think that models are, and AI is a really nice adjunct to the human in the system. Um, so for example, you know, our doctors are, are particularly good at, um, doctors and nurses, specifically the nurses, are, are particularly good at showing empathy for patients, for um, listening to their concerns, their values and preferences. And it's it's hard for a machine 
to demonstrate that empathy that we see in humans. Um, and so I don't ever, I personally don't foresee AI taking over the role of doctors or nurses because of the challenge of, you know, recreating empathy. Um, rather, I see these AI systems becoming as a, um, a second opinion to the doctors um, for initial opinions. Um, so now in light of the fact that you ended there and you, you talked a little bit about, you know, it kind of augmenting human analysis and we started out with both of you kind of alluding to some of the problems associated with bias, built in assumptions that can kind of skew models. I just want to come back to that in, in light of what we're experiencing kind of in real time today. Since AI does involve uh, inherent bias to build these models that influence outcomes and um, sometimes there, there is a lack of transparency or even awareness about what some of those are. Let's talk about that for a minute. Well, that, that's another tricky area. You're, you're exactly right. The, the problem of bias and assumptions, uh, it, it, ha it happens in several places. It, it does happen in, the, happen in the building of the model, as you just said. It happens in the interpretation of the results. Uh, it happens in between uh, when a model has been built uh, that, and, and has factors that are the result of assumptions or bias and doesn't really reflect the real world accurately enough. I think COVID can give us some examples of that. Uh, here's another place, though, where you, you don't want to rely entirely on the machine. The importance of the human expert is, is, is uh, heightened. A real expert, a person who's built many models and is, is very good at this and knows what's being modeled, understands what it is in the real world that is, is the model is going for, the more expert that person is, the more that person will be rigorous, the more that person will be self-monitoring. Uh, on the subject of bias. It is also possible, and you and I have talked about this in the past, Lauren, to set up AI that can keep an eye on AI, that we can do bias detection and bring it to the expert's attention. Um, you have to have a, a check and balance system in place, just like if it were a purely human system, you would have doctors checking each other's work. Uh, you'd be foolish not to. The same thing can happen here. When a model is, you know, veering off the path, and the algorithm drifts, you need mechanisms for watching for that and, and securing against it. And that's a cooperative effort. It means you need more than one human in the mix and you need to, you know, as I said, be checking each other's homework. And if need be, you can set your AI up to watch itself, to keep track of uh, its drift. Uh, that's really not something we're doing as standard practice today, but it won't be long before it is standard practice. Very good, Scott. So psychologists have um, long recognized that humans benefit from the use of heuristics um, in their judgments and decision making, um, and particularly making predictions about the future. Um, and heuristics are, you know, simple mental shortcuts that we take um, to help us help us function well in a busy environment. But we also know that heuristics, the use of heuristics leads to errors under certain circumstances. We can be fool, we can fool ourselves by relying on those heuristics. Um, and try as we might, I can I can tell a person um, that he's he's relying too heavily on a heuristic and that there are predictable biases that result from use of that heuristic. Um, but I can't effectively train away the use of heuristics. It's so ingrained into our cognitive processes that you really can't. You could take an expert in statistics, for example, who knows everything about regression to the mean and sample size importance, and yet they still make the fundamental error of putting too much weight on small samples, right? Because human experience shows shows them that um, the use of these heuristics work fine most of the time. Sometimes they fail, but most of the time they work. Um, and because they work, that reinforces the validity. Um, but humans are also emotionally connected to them. 
and that's where it's um, very challenging to move someone off of their heuristic, off the use of their heuristic. Computers, AI, machine learning doesn't have that emotional connection. Um, as Scott indicated, we can we can build an AI system to detect a bias and then correct for it. And that to me suggests that over time we can we can essentially move a an AI system from relying on heuristics to um, being completely bias free potentially over time as long as we can continually update and adapt to the identification of biases in the system. And that's a much a much different, maybe even better system than what we see for, with humans. Exactly. A word of warning though here on this point, Lauren, when you have an AI system watching the performance of itself, you basically are giving the system self-awareness and the next step from there is Westworld. So we could all be in a lot of trouble. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it could be an infinite loop too because right. the AI system that's doing the watching has its own biases. <laughs> yes, it is an infinite loop. Well, it's probably about, I don't know, 10 weeks ago when we talked last. Mm -hmm. It was right at the beginning of March, I believe, when our world was really starting mm -hmm. to change. And we talked quite a bit about misinformation and the fast flowing information. And, you know, I think this is sort of our next uh, foray into how AI and data analytics is, is really changing our, our perception of the world today as we know it, you know, in, in real time. And, be, and we're all kind of becoming more conversant in it. And I think we're thinking about this stuff more, more uh, regularly than we, we used to. So I want to thank both Scott, Scott Robinson, Scott LaJoy for joining me today. I hope you guys will join me again. Maybe oh, not sure. Yeah, maybe not great. 10 weeks from now, maybe maybe even sooner, although it's hard to get us all together, but that's what I'm hoping. Looking and forward to it. We, we can hope. We can hope that we'll get time on your schedules. So I, I really want to thank both Scots for joining us today and uh, hopefully having further discussion next time about AI, its promise and its limits on IoT World today. And until next time, I'm Lauren Horwitz, and we hope to see you on the site. Oh, that was fun.